Welcome to the DaVinci Hour podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Maxwell Cooper, and in this podcast series, I interview physicians, medical innovators, and entrepreneurs making an impact on healthcare. This podcast is produced by DaVinci Academy, a multimedia medical education company that provides podcasts, video courses, and digital textbooks. You can see more on our website, www.dviacademy.com, and our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash DaVinci Academy Med. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the DaVinci Hour podcast. I am joined this week by Dr. Alex Vaccaro, the department chairman and professor of orthopedic surgery at Thomas Jefferson University, and then the president of the Rothman Orthopedic Institute. So Dr. Vaccaro, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Welcome, Max. Um, so maybe give us just a little bit of background on, you know, your clinical practice, what your current position is, and, and uh, your training, where you did your training at as well. Sure. I'm a spine surgeon. I graduated Boston College, went to Georgetown. I did my internship at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, and I did my orthopedics at Thomas Jefferson University. And I did my spine fellowship at the University of California in San Diego, and then I came back to Jefferson. So the first advantage I had is that I've never left my first job. And you and I both know that 50 to 70% of people leave the first job after two to three years. And we tend to sit in a job that we don't like, or which it's not good for us because we have to you know, apply for the boards. We have to be in the same place for two years. So number one, my first advantage, and I'm very thankful for is that I like my partners. I like the business model. I like the direction that my boss, Dick Rothman gave. And he sort of fought to establish our business model, which I'll use a very tired term, privademic. So I hate that term, but let's just say that's what we are, privademics. And then we had a great healthcare partner. We, we teamed up with a great academic university that's now number seventh in US News and World Report in terms of orthopedics. So it's been a great academic uh, partnership. So that's where I am. And I studied spine surgery and all I do is spine surgery. And as a chairman, I strongly believe that you have to be a practicing orthopedic surgeon. I think you're more effective because I have to live with the same headaches as my partners do. I have to walk in and say, what do you mean the case is delayed? What do you mean we've changed the protocol? What do you mean we're, we're, we don't have any staffing? You know, all the things we live with in the post COVID. If I wasn't that chairman, I wouldn't know what they go through. So when I see my partners appearing to be burnt out, appearing to be disillusioned, getting to arguments with people, I have an understanding of what frustrates them. So I could sit down and articulate their concerns to those that have the power to change things. So Number one, as a leader, I think you have to put yourself in someone else's someone else's shoes. And that's what I do at Thomas Jefferson University. So I, I spend my mornings and I'm, I have the benefit of starting my ORS early at six o'clock in the morning, 6, 6.15. So I'm able to get 12 spine surgeries done a week. That's my four, four and four. And I get upset when they give me five cases in a day or six cases in a day because that throws me off. And I can usually be done by 12 noon. And then I sit down and I do my administrative work until I go home and I try to be home with my family for dinner every night. And then I'll do a seven to eight o'clock business meeting every night, which isn't bad because at that time I have a, at home, I have a six and a seven year old Christian and Mia, and they're, oh, they're doing their homework or they're doing stuff. So at that point I do my business meeting. So that's sort of my, my history. Um, we have a group that makes up about 220 doctors. We're in, Westchester County, New York, Manhattan, Hudson County, Bergen County. We're in Southern New Jersey. We're in Southeast Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and we're in Florida in the Orlando region. And we've developed a system, a business model where every region is nimble. Every region can make their autonomously their own business decisions. And we're separate cost centers that, is, that has an overriding superstructure of governance. So we do things by scale. So all economics stay locally because business is local. We have different insurance contracts in Southeast Pennsylvania than we do in Florida. And surgeons can make more or less depending on the specialty, but we have the same principles. We, we support academics and we, we give money based on how academically productive you are. So we have a point system. So if you give speeches at the academy, if you write papers, if you give local speeches, you get a certain amount of points. As you climb the ladder in terms of your academic status, you don't. If you may not be at a, a region where we have a university, but if you're at the level of an associate professorship, you get more money. So that puts you in a different shareholder class. And we're trying to evolve that over time because we see the inequities that the orthopedic world has created. 
if you look at a typical orthopedic partnership, it's based on revenue, time in a practice, and citizenship. And what we've noticed is that that's discriminatory against people of color and people and, and gender. Because if a woman decides that she wants to work as hard as she can work, but she has to raise kids or take time off from maternity leave, well, then you've taken revenue out because she can't make as much as someone else is working. So we're trying to evolve the system that only time in a practice and citizenship determine partnership. And then you could work as much as you want and you can work as, as, as little as you want. And then your income will change, but you still have a partner with the legal protections that a partner gets. And then it, la it makes it more comfortable as you age. So you can wind down in a very graceful way. You don't, okay, if you have a cutoff, you have to make X amount of dollars. And, you know, orthopedics is a young person sport. And all of a sudden now you're 60, 65, and you're getting tired. You don't want to be partnered and kicked out of a group. You want to just say, listen, I'll work less, spend more time with my family and your revenue goes down. But hopefully at that time, you put your kid through college, you've been on your third spouse, you've decided to, to uh, you know, sell your, your beach house and so forth. So that's sort of our business model. Now, the things that I think stand out when people use the term privademics, it's a funny term. It means that we basically have autonomy. And I look at the three things that make people happy. You can't strive for happiness. You have to have a purpose. You have to master that purpose and you have to have autonomy to make decisions. And our group has the autonomy to make a good decision or a bad decision. So when we sit down and negotiate with insurance companies, we can accept a contract or we can reject the contract. And then we go at risk for rejecting. We can make uh, bundle payments. We can do a retrospective bundle. We could do a prospective bundle. We could look at the outliers and say, can we control those? And we take risks. Someone else is not making those decisions for us because I know what my strengths are. I know what my weaknesses are. I know what my volumes are. So that's what makes us who we are. And you know, we're, we have a size and, and don't let anyone fool you. It's, it's not a fluke that all these mergers are happening. The larger you are, the greater the voice you have and the more leverage you have. So we can go for fair reimbursement for hard work that an orthopedic surgeon does. So that's a global overview of our model. Now, we use, in my uh, spine fellowship that we have, we usually get the four top candidates in the country. And when we hire physicians, we get to know them. It's like a one-year interview. We do an apprenticeship with them. So at that point, we say, listen, would you like to join the Lothman Institute? Do you have the quality, you have the integrity, you have the ethics, you have the compassion, uh, you're altruistic, all the things that we want in patient-centered care, and we offer them a job. So we're able to hire many of our graduates into the Rothman Institute so the culture stays the same. Because remember, culture trumps strategy any day of the week. So that's how it works. That's so interesting. That, did you fall asleep for that, <laughs> that diatribe? No, no, that was a great overview. That was am I going to be my next question. You just went right into it was kind of giving a 30,000 foot overview of, of the Rothman Institute. I, I a couple of follow-up <laughs> questions as you were talking, I guess one is, you know, I'm sure you've heard, bef you know, people say, oh, if you're, you know, productive academically, then you're not good clinically, or you can't, you can't balance the both. And, and I'm just curious from you, obviously you personally have been able to do all many things, you know, very productively, but I'm curious how you guys foster that at the Rothman Institute. Like, how do you keep clinical productivity and outcomes good, but also encouraging, you know, people to do research, other things like that, teaching. Sure. That's one of the myths. So let me tell you the myths that you and I hear. There's such things as good, fast surgeons, but there's no such thing as a good, slow surgeon. I, I was told that if you teach, then you can't practice effectively what you teach. That's another you know, misrepresentation. Some of the greatest surgeons that I've ever worked with were the most facile with their hands. So, and, and, and I don't know what percentage of orthopedic surgeons are gifted academically or have an interest in academics or gifted from the physical sense that they have great dexterity. But the nice thing about having a fellowship that has 28 fellows is that we see these people all the time. I'm always amazed when I see a fellow and I'm like, that guy's better than I am. I always say, that guy only needs is to cook a little bit longer and to marinate a little bit and he's gonna be phenomenal. And that's the person we grab. So someone who has the ability to design prospective randomized studies, to collect data, to analyze data, to help a resident fellow, a medical student, uh, write a paper. So that's what we do. And those people come along and we say, listen, you have a gift for academics. Now, I never listen to any applicant that says to me, hey, I want to join the Rothman Institute um, and I'm going to go into academics. Well, that's never true. People say that to get into our fellowships. I sit back and I look at 
how much publications they did in the past and where their presentations were. And then I watch them as a fellow, if they're truly interested in academics and that's all you want. I can care less if you're a brilliant academician. If you're not interested, you're not gonna do anything. So I watch what they do and I, I notice that they spend time with the residents, they spend time with the, res the fellows, they spend time with the personnel and, I, mm -hmm. and they're getting papers done. And I say, that's the guy I want, or that's the woman I want. And I say, listen, let's hire you. And they're like, yeah, I'd love to. And then we have a system that rewards academic productivity. If, you, if you're working hard academically, you, you make it. So, which is perfect. That's cool. I'm curious also from a research standpoint, you, you must have an incredible infrastructure, you know, like I think you were alluding to, obviously you have a massive residency program and, you know, you have a medical school there, but I'm curious, like how from a private practice or private demic model as you, I know you don't like that term, but from the way you've described it, uh, how do you build that? Like, how do you collect the data? How do you, you know, essentially build such a high performing research machine, if you will, from the Rothman right. Institute? So number one, it takes time. So I started as a faculty member. I was a resident from 1988 to 1993. And then the first thing I did is I developed a registry. Listen how simple it was. I took an Excel spreadsheet and every single patient that came in, I dictated a one page note that populated the registry data bank. So you would come in, a, a resident would do a consultation they give me the consultation sheet. And then I dictate all the open frames on an Excel spreadsheet. And I never stopped doing that. So since 1973 until today, every single spine admission that comes through that emergency room, I dictate that populates a database. Now those databases have been fine. Now we have AI calling data out of, a, out of the database. And then over time, you get a following. The medical students know if they work with you, they get publications that'll help their application. So you first work with the medical students. Then you work with the residents. Then you work with the fellows because now you're selecting fellows that have an interest in academics. And then you have revenue that comes in. Um, you do a clinical study, you get money for that. So then you use that money to get a statistician. You use that money to get a clinical coordinator. So over the years, you build up a large research infrastructure. So every Monday, I meet with 20 students. That's Monday's a student day. And then on Wednesday, all the residents come in and all the, the faculty that are interested in doing research. And then every Tuesday, I meet with the basic science professors. So we spend time every single day working on our research because we've developed an infrastructure and you know, we run it like a business. You know, you have a balance sheet, you have an income statement, you have cash flow, you have revenue. Um, you have to, we have to get R01 grants in the basic science world and we have to get clinical grants for the clinical uh, studies that we write. So we're looking for money all the time uh, to subsidize the studies. So that's how we do it. So you, you just can't say, I wanna write papers. That's not happening. I mean, remember Einstein, when he wrote his famous paper, E equals MC squared, apparently he was a patent officer in, in Zurich, Switzerland, and he just wrote it out of his head. That's not how it works. It costs a lot of money to publish a paper. So we have to develop that infrastructure and everyone pays for it. Like we, that's part of our overhead. Everyone contributes. Interesting. Yeah, no, I think it's a, an interesting statement you make that you have to, you can't just half-heartedly do it. You have to really make the commitment. And it sounds like you certainly have at the, at the Rothman Institute. Um, I'm curious, you know, at, you were mentioning this when you're giving your overview, you know, all these health, these ever expanding health systems and they're, you know, as you know, they're both academic systems and they're also these private systems as well. How do you guys stay independent in this, you know, day when like, I feel like every day you hear of a new like community hospital being bought or a new private practice being bought. How, how do you think you guys have been able to stay like an independent physician group this long? Well, Number one is the desire to remain independent because I think we have a greater voice if, if we remain independent. I, I was recently at a hand graduation party where a bunch of the hand surgeons worked for hospitals. So they were making half of what we make. They have no voice. They go to work, they go home. It just didn't seem appealing to me. So the reason why we can stay independent is because we have a healthy balance sheet. And how do we have a healthy balance sheet? We take something called retained earnings. Everyone contributes a certain amount of their salary every month to retained earnings, which we use to offset capital costs and our business mission. So we always have cash flow. We don't go to the debt markets. We don't take money out. We don't sell our practice to a private equity at this point. So keeping a healthy balance sheet allows us to stay independent and then constantly negotiating for fair, appropriate um, reimbursements and then getting the bundle payments. We started bundle payments about 12 years ago. And in terms of gain sharing and splitting the profits, we've done great because we, start, we show this is what it costs to do a total joint and the community. We could do it for less than that, but for the savings, we want to get 50% of it. And then we use that to self-invest into our business. So that's what we do in that situation. So it's been great. 
Interesting. Now I'm curious, uh, you know, I'm here at Emory and they, they have the orthopedic group, as you probably even know or heard, they have their own orthopedic hospital here. That's like exclusively orthopedic care. I'm curious, like as the Rothman Institute, do you guys have your own facilities that are strictly yours that not even, you know, even an academic partner would own that's kind of your own ambulatory care surgery or your, your own clinic or anything like that? Yeah. So actually it's a little bit different than what Emory has. I'm familiar. I may have a great chairman, Scott Bowden. We have independent um, hospitals. And what we did is once we built it up, we sold a portion of it to the universities because we think it's important to have a university partner. So one hospital, we have two hospitals. One we sold to mainline health, a portion of it. The other one we sold and we sold a portion to Thomas Jefferson University. The other one we sold to Thomas Jefferson University. And, and we bought these hospitals from certain physicians that still own a piece of it. So we own our hospitals and we help manage the hospitals. I mean, it has an independent management group, but we sit down and we're on the board and we make it work well. So that's our goal. So we decide how the management has to go. And listen, we know the balance sheet. We know if we make it doing well. The biggest, I'll give you an example, total joint arthroplasty. The university, the CMS is coming out saying these patients have to be uh, outpatient only. So they're paying, we're paying the doctors that go to these, these groups outpatient only. So it, it cut down our revenue significantly. So if you, if you take a, a patient from the university and you move it to our specialty hospital, CMS is still paying outpatient rates for it. Not HOPD rates, not inpatient hospital rates, but outpatient ASC rates. So you take a dramatic cut. So then we have to just respond. We have to cut costs. We have to figure out how to make it more efficient. We do, we do time, we do time driven cost accounting where we we know exactly what it costs for you as a patient to come into the front door, be, be pushed on a cart to, to a patient's room, um, how much that salary is, how much that salary is, and so forth. So we know exactly what it costs. And we say, okay, this is our BATNA. Over here, the term BATNA, B-A-T-N-A. You have your target price, your reservation price, your BATNA. Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. I think it, that's what it's called. Okay. When you get an MBA, they teach all these, um, these, these terms. So I know exactly what I need to do when I negotiate with an insurer, I know an answer server with decompression infusion costs me $27,000. So mm. I can't negotiate less than 27,000 or for some reason I'm not making money. And then I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the red. So I have to negotiate above that. It, and it's so powerful when you know what your real costs are, not what your charge master says, not what your charges are, what your real costs are. I, I'm curious, you know, you've been doing this obviously a long time. What would be your advice if there were a group of you know, either physicians in private practice or a group of physicians at an academic practice, what would be your advice if they said, Hey, we want to start something like the Rothman Institute. What would be like, I realize we could probably do a whole podcast on that, but like, what would be like the first critical steps? Well, it's not that complicated. So number one, it's better to get like-minded people together. The the easiest way to do it is to get a bunch of groups together that have productive orthopedic surgeons. That's the first step. I mean, if you get about six guys together, you're going to have to go to the banks and take out loans. Now, remember I told you, I don't like debt on my balance sheet. So then all of a sudden you're leveraged now where you have to pay interest on something. So you're behind the eight ball. We sort of did that in 1996, 97, 98, where we were paying ourselves a salary. I was was paying myself 5,000 a month for a few years. I was making 60,000 a year because we just started out back then the Rothman Institute. It had been there for forever, but there was a lot of changes in the market. So you want to get a bunch of like-minded people together that re- that are similarly similar when it comes to mission and culture. Once you get that together, then you just need to have a good business person that has an understanding of how to negotiate rates with an insurance company, understand CMS, understands the revenue from taking care of Medicare, figure out what you want to do with Medicaid. And then if you really want to kill it, find a capital partner such as a healthcare system that has a fragmented orthopedic group and say, listen, we'll bring consistency. We'll cover your ERs. We'll cover your trauma. We'll cover everything you need. Please give us a service line agreement to help you make your hospital more organized and productive. And then that's how you do it. So tell them to write that down and follow that. <laughs> and we'll no, that's, that's great advice. That's great advice. Um, I guess I'm curious, you know, you touched a little bit on this, but like, let's say, you know, when you hire your fellows, but let's say someone from the outside, another academic practice or private practice, what do you look for when like that someone says, hey, they email you say, hey, Dr. Vercaro, I'd like to join the Rothman Institute. Like, what are you looking for? Or like yeah. the kind of person that fits with your culture, like yeah. you described? So number one, it's culture. So like anything else, change is the norm. So we're changing our overhead structure now because we, we're changing with the times. So the first thing I get together and say, listen, are you comfortable by giving a small premium to the, our brand? And our brand is academics teaching and doing research. 
that's the first thing I do. They say, listen, you know, we're still, we're just into making money and going home and playing golf on Wednesdays and Sundays, and that's not going to work. But if, like, if they're like, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. If, you, if you have a brand, healthcare systems want to work with you, you can get better contracts. That's the first thing we do. So once they buy into that, then I say, listen, let's look at how you organize your business. Is it a democracy, which is what we are, but we have to sit down and we have to vote. We have a quorum for any any balance sheet revenue questions. Like if you want to change the overhead, 80% of the group has to agree to it. If 80% of the group doesn't agree to it, you can't do it. So do they have the same understanding of the overhead structure? If you have one group that pays all the overhead and everyone else benefits, that's eventually going to fail. So if everyone pays their fair share of the overhead, everyone gets their fair share of the ancillaries and the passive income, that's a viable business model. And then you have to have people in the group that want to spend their time being a leader. So you have to have physicians that are open-minded, fair, that will lead the group. And that's what you need. Interesting. I'm curious, do you guys do anything with like device development or, cause obviously orthopedics is a field that's ripe for that. Is that something you, you encourage among your physicians or that you have like infrastructure for in addition to your, your research? Okay. So we don't support that within a group, but we give free license. If anyone wants to declare their conflicts and do it. So one of the bad things that, you know, working directly for a university, they own your intellectual property. Mm-hmm. So we don't do this. The Rothman Institute doesn't own anyone's intellectual property. We do make sure that you disclose it. You can't be on any product committee within the Rothman Institute because we have a lot of products we buy. So you can't be, you know, consulting for an MRI machine and then try to sell it to me within my own group. That's a conflict of interest. So we respect the letter of the law when it comes to conflicts. But if, but if you invent a cure for something, it's yours. And I think that's another strong uh, point about the Rothman Institute. Yeah, no, definitely. I, you know, the academics. It's obviously you get some support there, but like you said, it's. It's tough because they own your they own it and they take a big cut of your grants and your funding and everything at the end of the day. I'm curious from as we close up here, how do you advise your residents and fellows when they go out to look for jobs? Like what what do you advise them to look for in the practice? You know, because um, you know, there's a lot of options out there. I guess what what do you think, you know, to ensure they get what they want out of out of their career? I'm just sure. curious. The number one, you don't know who you are yet. You don't know what you want in life. So the first thing you have to do is whoever your partner is, you have to say, would you be happy in this geographic region? So that's the first thing. So if the answer is yes, that's a good thing. Then you have to sit down and you have to meet the partners, figure out if you like the partners, and then you have to figure out how they run their operations. If it's a group that several people own everything, they own the buildings that you rent, they own the ASCs, that's not working out well for anybody. That's just a temporary job because it's not fair to you because you're going to come in and you're going to contribute. You're going to give uh, all your time and effort to build something. It should be, you should have an opportunity over time to become a partner and get an equal share of whatever your work effort is. So then you want to make sure the business model suits what you want to do. Now, if you're into academics, you'll sway for an academic group. If you do strictly private practice, you'll sway for a strictly private practice, but you're only going to be happy if you have autonomy if you can master what you want to do, but if you feel like you're being taken advantage of, it's not going to work. So those are the things. Does your partner like where you're going? Do you like your partners that you're joining? Do you feel it's fair from an academic perspective? And does it have the things that interest you, academics and academics? Excellent. Well, my my last question is we ask everybody this, when you're not doing surgery and managing the Rothman uh, Institute, what what do you do with your, your time outside of work? <laughs> Okay, so I hang out with my kids who are right here who want me to play with them right now. So I play with my kids. I have, I have four kids. So I play with my kids. I go out to dinner with them all the time. I, I try to make sure the weekend is totally for them. So I wake up really early, like 3.34. I do all my academic work before they wake up. I spend time with my family until they go to bed and then I do academic work then. And whenever I had a break, I take my break. And then I like sports. I'm, I'm the team doctor for the, as a spine surgeon for the Eagles. So I'm into sports. I take care of the 76ers. So I love sports. And then I'm a stamp collector, United States, oh, wow. United States mint stamp collector. So if anyone out there wants to get rid of the United States mint stamps and just give it to me for free, send it over. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Dr. Vercaro, thank you so much. This was really informative and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. You're welcome, Max. And thank you for saying hello to my family during this podcast. Oh, no worries. (laughs) Thank you for listening to this episode of the DaVinci Hour podcast presented by DaVinci Academy. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your podcast platform of choice to catch the latest episodes. Please leave a comment or review and share it with a friend. Lastly, you can find all of our podcasts, video courses, and books on our website, dviacademy.com. Thank you for listening.